So what are blockchain bridges then? Picture it, two different blockchains, like two different islands. They've got assets, they've got data, but getting those assets and data between the two different islands, pretty difficult. Bit of a hassle. That's where bridges come in. You build a cheeky little bridge between the two islands. It allows you to take something from one chain and pop it over onto the other chain. That's something being tokens, assets, NFTs, any kind of data you want. Simply the message, hey there, could be transported over. This is cross-chain messaging. A blockchain bridge typically involves transferring tokens from one chain to another. But why do we need to transfer data and assets cross-chain? Why do we even need bridges? Well, when you're interacting with chains, like if you're on a roll-up like ZK Sync, you need gas fees to pay for your transactions. A bit like if you're in the UK, you need pounds, but if you head over to America, you're gonna need some dollars. The money needs to be converted. It works a little bit differently on each chain. Got some ETH on Ethereum? Lovely, but you'll have to convert it to some ETH on ZK Sync if you want to use it over there. Now there's gonna be a little bit of terminology here. We've got bridging, which typically refers to cross-chain transfers of tokens, moving tokens cross-chain, and then also cross-chain messaging, which is just any arbitrary data. It could be tokens, but that's more specific. Any arbitrary data or message or even tokens sending cross-chain is cross-chain messaging. Bridging is a type of cross-chain messaging where you're sending specifically tokens. When we talk about bridging, we're taking funds, from one chain to another chain. We typically refer to the chain that we're taking the funds from as the source chain and the chain that we're taking the funds to, the destination chain. You got the source, where it came from, and then the destination, where you're taking it to. So with that said, how does bridging work? Well, there are a couple of different mechanisms for bridging and I am about to give you the tea. The first is a burn and mint bridge, where the tokens are burned on the source chain, they're taken out of circulation, and they're minted on the destination chain. They're given to you. Here, the same number of tokens that are burnt are minted. This keeps the total supply constant across the two chains. So there's no doubling up. The second type is a lock and unlock bridge. This is a bridge in which the funds are locked in a vault on the source chain and then unlocked from a vault on the destination chain. However, this can lead to fragmented liquidity because you're managing multiple chains and trying to ensure that there's liquidity for each. You may need some kind of liquidity providers. Not ideal if you want smooth transactions. There is also lock and mint bridges. This type of bridge is a little bit different. Let's say you've got tokens on the source chain that have already been minted, but the protocol doesn't have the ability to mint or burn these tokens. They don't have the admin rights. Instead, these tokens are locked in a vault on the source chain, and then new wrapped versions of these tokens are minted on the destination chain. An example of a wrapped token is USDCE, which is USDC wrapped so that it is compatible with chains other than Ethereum, such as Arbitrum, Linear, or ZK Sync. This is to differentiate it from the native unwrapped version USDC. These wrapped tokens are essentially an IOU that can be used on other blockchains. And finally, we have burn and unlock bridges. This is like the reverse of a lock and mint bridge. Here, tokens are burned on the source chain where the source chain is the non-issuing blockchain for these tokens. Instead, there's some kind of wrapped tokens. And an equivalent amount of these tokens is issued from the vault on the destination chain, which is in fact the issuing blockchain, the blockchain in which these tokens come from. With this ability to send data and assets cross-chain, you can build cross-chain protocols like DeFi applications, outsource computation to cheaper chains, aggregate cross-chain yield, create cross-chain NFTs, create hot cross buns, create a crisscross crisscross, play noughts and crosses. Wait, wasn't the joke about CrossFit? Oh no, that's not for me. That's, this is Pat's joke. I've stolen it. The hands up. Now let's talk about how bridges are managed. They can be either centralized or decentralized. Often when people are bridging their funds cross chain, they're gonna use a centralized bridge and they're gonna get wrecked. They'll connect their wallet, they'll hit swap, and then they'll pray that the money will show up on the other side. Centralized bridges are run by a single entity, which means that you need to trust them to manage your assets responsibly. It's like you're sending your assets to someone and you're saying, please send me the same amount of tokens on the destination chain. And then you just wait nervously on the edge of your seat, hoping and praying that your tokens will in fact turn up on the other side. And this isn't really the best approach. Instead, we want to use decentralized bridges. Uh -huh. These are trust minimized bridges that instead of relying on one single entity to make sure that they keep their promise that they're gonna give you the tokens on the other chain, you're instead relying on the trustworthiness of a network of people. Chainlink CCIP offers this decentralized solution. 
Instead of moving your funds through a single point of failure, a single entity who may in fact not give you your funds on the other chain, you move your funds through a collection of decentralized chain link nodes, where if one of these nodes acts maliciously, then the other nodes will punish them, making the system trust minimized. You may have also heard the terms native and third party bridges. Let's go through what those mean. Native bridges are built by the blockchain team themselves. So for instance, if you're working on ZK Sync, then there is a ZK Sync native bridge, which is built by the ZK Sync or Matter Labs team. They're pretty secure and trustworthy, but they're usually compatible only within their own network. And they can be pretty slow as they require you to wait for finality, which can be between 24 hours for ZK rollups and seven days for optimistic rollups. So you just send your money off and then you have to wait seven days to receive your funds on the other side. Pretty annoying. Third party bridges, on the other hand, are developed independently from the team who built and manage the chain. These types of bridges usually don't require you to wait for finality and instead have some kind of liquidity pools and allow you to instantly get your funds on the other side. However, because they require some kind of liquidity providers, the fees are usually pretty high as you need to pay the fees to pay for the liquidity providers. There can also be some security risks due to the fact that you don't need to wait for finality. So if there's some kind of rollback or reorg, then your transaction could be reversed. Different types of bridges include CCIP Transporter, which is a bridge built using Chainlink CCIP. CCIP is a decentralized cross-chain interoperability protocol that allows you to send cross-chain messages in a secure and scalable way. Transporter is a bridging application built in association with the Chainlink Foundation that utilizes CCIP to send your tokens cross-chain. There's also Wormhole's Portal. Wormhole is another cross-chain messaging protocol and Portal is a bridging application built by the Wormhole team using Wormhole. Bridges are a pretty big deal. They allow us to transfer our tokens cross-chain and cross-chain messaging is also pretty crucial. However, as Vitalik said, the future is multi-chain and not cross-chain due to the security issues. However, due to the fact that billions of dollars have already been bridged cross-chain, there is a need for these applications. So make sure that you research the security of protocols that you're interacting with cross-chain. So if you build a cross-chain application and you want to make sure that it's secure, make sure you get it audited, either a competitive audit by putting it on Codehawks or a private audit by reaching out to Cypherin directly for a private audit for your project. Thanks so much for watching and I'll see you in the next one.